So as we begin today, church, the Lord placed it on my heart today to talk a little bit about restoration. A little bit about restoration. And how many of you know today that God is a restorer? God's a restorer. Whatever the enemy has tried to take from you, you know, whatever he, he's, you know, got from you, the Lord wants to restore it. God wants to make it better than before. And that's the kind of father, you know, he is. And, and, and every, every, just about every time I, I get up here, you know, pastor always says something or, or, or we sing a song or something that speaks a little bit about, you know, what we're going to talk about today. And I just confirm, you know, that that our heavenly father is here. He's in the midst. Right. He's in the midst. See, church, every day we have choices put before us. We can either complain about the state we're in or we can give thanks, you know, for our current situation. You know, we can ask God why and why me and all this kind of stuff here. Or we could just give thanks in every situation. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and 18, it says, In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. In the New Living Translation, it says, Be thankful in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. See, church, to give thanks in everything. I mean, everything. You, you can't be on spiritual milk. Not to give thanks in everything. You know, you, you can't be eating out, out, out your spiritual high chair, Amen. you know. Amen. You, you got to have some meat in your diet. You, to give thanks in everything, got to have a little bit of meat in your diet. But, but that's what the word asks us to do. Ask us to do that. There's some difficult situations that you may have encountered in the past. Some that you may be in right now. Some that may be down the road. And you say, man, how am I going to give thanks in that? I got the answer. Because the word says, give thanks in everything. Don't ask why. Just accept it and give thanks. See, it's the reason God chose you to go through. Pastor said it earlier, you built for this. You built for this. That's why he, he, he knows what we can handle and what we can go through. We're built for it. But the thing is, you can't try to do it in your own strength. You got to trust and believe in him and allow him to, 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 get, you, to get you through it. You know, I'll, I'll use this example a, a lot, you know. How do you know if you're getting any stronger if you don't put more weight on the bar? I mean, you could faithfully go to the gym four days a week, four days a week, same time, 6 a.m., four days a week. Every time you go, I lift 100 pounds, and I do it 30 reps. Man, that, that's some faithfulness right there. But you really don't know if you're getting any stronger unless you put five more pounds on that bar or 10 more pounds, unless instead of 30 reps, you try to do 35 reps. You really don't know if you're getting any stronger. Same thing with our spiritual walk. We come to church. We come to Bible study. We come to fourth watch prayers. Some of us come to fourth watch prayers. You know, we on the fast and we in men's meeting and women's meeting. I mean, we do all of this stuff right here, but we really don't know if we're receiving this stuff or how much stronger we're getting until that test comes. Until that test comes. So as I said earlier, we're going to talk briefly this morning about God's restoration. So if you don't mind, I want you to turn in your Bibles or your electronic devices to Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. And we're going to read verses 25 through 27. Joel chapter 2, verses 25 through 27. I'll give you a second to find it. And if you would, Please stand uh, for the reading in reverence of God's holy word. Joel chapter 2, verses 25 through 27. Please say amen when you get there. Amen. amen. Let's read. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army, which I sent among you, and ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. Before you have your seats, 
Just turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor. neighbor. In order for something to be restored, it's got to be jacked up. Amen. You may have your seats. See, church, in order for something to be restored, it's got to be jacked up. It's got to be messed up. The definition of restoration is the act of restoring, renewal, revival, or reestablishment, the state or fact of being restored, a return of something to a former, original, normal, or unimpaired condition. It's the definition of restoration. Y'all, I've got an old car. <clears throat> it's a 1973 Cadillac Eldorado convertible. Okay? It's a white car. It's white interior. Blue trimming on the seats to, to, to match the top, you know. It's, it's in pretty good condition. Nice looking car, pretty good condition. However, I didn't buy it like that. I didn't buy the car like that. When I bought the car, you know, I had to fix some rust spots here, some rust in the floorboard in the back, some rust on the hood. You know, I had to, to, to do a couple things to the engine here and there. I had to redo all of the interior and the carpet in the car. So I, I, I put some work into the car in restoring the car. The funny thing is, when I drive this car, I get so much attention when I drive this car. I mean, it, it never fails when I drive it. I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm going down the road, and people will roll down their windows and give me thumbs up, and, you know, and I'm just, hey, how y'all doing? They just shoot thumbs up, and they pull up next to me and say, hey, man, what year is that? I say, uh, you know, what, what, uh, what, what kind of engine is in that car, man, and how long you had it, and, and is that a one-owner, man, and it doesn't have this. I mean, they just ask me all these questions, you know, all these questions about this car, and I just kind of sit there, and I stick my chest out a little bit, and I say, it's a 1973. Cadillac Eldorado. It's got the uh, 8.2 liter V8, 500 cubic inches, four barrel carburetor, quadrajet uh, Rochester carburetor on it. Got to use premium gas in it because they cars were meant to run on leaded gas. And I mean, I proudly sit there and give them every detail I know about this car and the process I went through to restore this car and to get it to where it is now. Now, on the flip side, I've seen it. I've seen y'all pull up in church. Some of y'all, most of y'all got some nice, I'm talking about some nice cars. I'm talking about sharp, clean, new. I'm talking about some bad rides out there in the parking lot. My wife, she's got a pretty nice car. It's not brand new, but it's, it's newer, way newer than my 73 Cadillac. Nice car. It's silver. She keeps it clean, keeps it smelling good. I love to drive the car. She don't let me drive it much, but I love to drive that car. The thing about driving that car, as nice as it is, Nobody pulls up next to me and gives me thumbs up. <laughs> Nobody stops me and says, hey, man, what year is that right there? What, what motor is in that car right there, man? Is that the one with the this and the that? And that? Yeah, nobody's there. And, and it's way nicer than my car. But when I drive the, the Cadillac, they always asking me about it. They always saying, see, church, when something gets restored, people want to know about it. People want to know how, how you got that. How did that happen right there? You know, when something was in bad shape, broke down, seemed like it was useless, good for nothing, and then someone comes along and restores it, people are amazed and they want to hear the story. They want to know how you did it. How did that happen? How did you get this car to look like this? And, and they want to know. Oftentimes, the restored look is just as good or sometimes better in the original look sometimes. I'm going somewhere with this, y'all, so y'all just hang in there with me. I'm going somewhere with it. Think about your life. Think about your life. If you were born into an extremely rich family, extremely rich family, the great-grandfather was rich, the grandfather was rich, the father was rich, and you inherited all this money, you know what I'm saying, and you're just rich, no big deal. You're supposed to be rich. You inherited all this money, and it's been passed down and passed down. Your whole family's rich. No big deal. But you think about somebody who had nothing, maybe, I mean, and worked and worked and worked and became rich, and they got all this stuff now, and then some, something happens. Could be a fault of their own, may not be a fault of their own, but something happens, and they lose everything, and they lose it. 
and then they spend five, six, seven, eight, ten years, and they get it restored, and now they're back to where they were, and they've got what they had, and then some. You're going to want to hear about what happened in that, in that person's life right there. How did they go from that, and they lost everything, and now they got it back, and they're here now, and they're better off than they were. You're going to you want to hear about that story. It's the same thing in our Christian walk. Same thing in our Christian walk, church. When we go through trials, the trials of life, and we're down for a little while, you know, going through that rough spell or what we call sometimes those hard places we get in sometimes. Like in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, the scripture says, We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. When we find ourselves in those places or situations, we have to trust and depend on him. And in his time, he will restore. Now, when God restores, God, he, he just restores. Now, guess what? People are going to ask questions when God restores. They gotta, they're going to want to know. The same way they asked me about that restored Cadillac, they're going to want to know about our spiritual walk and how we got restored. They're going to want to know every single detail, and we've got to be as believers willing to give them the details. You know, and we can't do that mess that the world teaches us. Now the, world, the world talks some foolishness now. They'll tell you, you know, well, you know, how, how did you get back to this point? How did you do this right here? Well, you know, God helps those who help themselves. You know, I pull myself up by my own bootstraps. You know, I just dug my heels in, man, and through determination and grit, I was determined I was going to accomplish my goals and achieve every goal I set. And that's how I got there. No, uh-uh. We got to talk about and tell them what the Lord has done in our lives. What he's done in our lives. He may have even used people. People to help you. But again, he put those people in place to help you. He put them in place. Teacher, God wants to restore everything you've lost, given away, or that's been stolen. Yeah, I said given away because, you know, Sometimes we give this stuff away. We know as believers, we have an adversary. And and, and we just sang that song, you know. He's got three jobs. Steal, kill, and destroy. Steal, kill, and destroy. But again, sometimes he doesn't have to steal it. We give it away. We give this stuff away. Our joy, our peace, our strength, you know, our time, our money. We just give this stuff away. I mean, you, you, you think about it. That's crazy, church. You think about it, if, if you woke up in the middle of the night and you caught a robber in your house, a thief in your house, not a robber, a thief, you know, because a robber going to put a gun, a knife to your throat and say, give it to me. But a thief, he's going to sneak in there and, and try to do it, you know, without you knowing. You catch a thief in your house in the middle of the night. You wake up and you see him and when you say, hey, and he can take off for the door. You say, wait right there. Don't go out that door yet. Come back in here. Hey, man, you didn't get everything. I got some more money over here that you, you, you didn't get. I got some jewelry back there in the back room that you didn't know about. And there's some uh, couple TVs back there in that back room looking to closet. Two brand new TVs that hadn't even opened up yet. When you get all that stuff, I'll help you carry it out to the getaway car. And you drive on off and go on about your business. Now, will we do that? No. No, we're not going to do that. So why do we give the enemy our joy, our time, our peace? I mean, our strength. Why we give him that? Why we give him that? We, he says he comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but we give him the stuff sometimes. So today, as I said, I want to briefly talk about three aspects of God's restoration. Number one, it must be God's restoration. It's got to be his restoration. Number two, you must accept it. You got to accept it. And number three, we've got to wait on God's timing. We've got to wait on God's timing. So number one, it must be God's restoration. One thing about our Heavenly Father, he is faithful to his promises because he's an awesome God. He's faithful to his promises. When it comes to restoration, it must be God's restoration. See, church, many times we'll orchestrate things on our own, put some stuff together, you know, I mean, in our own strength and call friends and call people. And, and, and put this mess together and then try to bring God into it later on. You know, when we get to a place 
on this journey we've orchestrated that we can't go any further. Now I want to bring God in this. Or we'll simply just do it, manufacture it all ourselves, and then say that God did it. You know, oftentimes when blessings come from God, you don't even see God's hand at work. You don't even see it. You don't see it until sometime later on you start playing things back in your mind. You say, that just don't make sense right there. How in the world? I mean, why would that person there do that? I just, that's God's hand at work. And all you can do is look at it and say, wow, God is good. Now, when we're in the world, we thought it was luck, coincidence, you know, who we know, who knows us. And, that, and that's what we put it on. You know, we, we thought we were something, but now that we're believers, we know better. We know that's not the case. Number two, not only must it be God's restoration and not us trying to manufacture stuff, but we've got to accept how he restores. You got to accept how he restores. You know, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 11, the word says, if ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Now, see, we as adults, we often get on our kids. We tell our kids all the time, grandkids, younger nieces and nephews, you know, anytime children, whether you teach them, whatever, you, you, relationship with a child, you always repeatedly tell them they don't know what they're talking about. We say stuff to them like, you know, I've been living longer than you. I've been doing this longer than you. I was here before you was born. I done been there, done that, et cetera, et cetera. And we're right. And we are exactly right. We've done it numerous times, you know, and we've all done it as parents. OK, but when it comes to us as believers listening to God, hmm, we do the same thing. If it doesn't line up, if it does not line up with what we think or how we think it should go, we, we, we don't we don't agree with it. We don't go along with that. God, that's that, that's not for me right there. God, that ain't what the no, non God that that's not what I'm asking for right there. But we get on our children when they don't listen. But then we do the same thing. Church, our heavenly father has a plan for each and every one of our lives. Each and every one of our lives, he's got a plan. And he knows exactly how he wants to get us there. He knows how he wants to get us there. Church, I lost my job about three years ago to this day. Lost my job, man. Crazy, man. Lost my job. Well, let me quit being cute. I ain't lose my job. Them folks fired me, y'all. <laughs> Them folks, I'm talking about, I'm talking about get your stuff, and get up out this place, change the locks on the door, get out of here. You got to go, you know. But that was rough on me, you know. In church, I, I hadn't been fired from a job, man, since like 1993. That was the last time I got fired from a job. It was my senior year of high school, and I, I worked at McDonald's, you know. And, and, you know, it was my senior year, man. I was trying to grow my little beard and everything, man. I had a little peach fuzz on my face, and I was trying to grow it. And I had just got this thing to connect. I mean, just got it to connect, you know. <laughs> struggling, man, to get them pieces together, but I got them to connect, you know, and uh lady came in, she told me, she said, uh, Terrence, I thought I told you to shave before you came back to work, and I said, Miss Lady, I'm sorry, I, I said, I just got this to connect, I, I can't cut this <laughs> off right here. Woman looked at me and said, you fired, turn your apron in, <laughs> turn your apron, your hat, and your tie. Turn it in. See, we had to wear ties back at, at McDonald's then. Pastor Paul, Brother Reggie, they worked at McDonald's. They know what I'm talking about. They spent some time there. But um, woman fired me, man. Turn your stuff in. But, but getting back to me getting fired three years ago, this was the beginning of God starting a restoration process. He was starting it. He was starting that process right there in this particular season of my life. I couldn't see it then, but, you know, after some time and trusting in God, I saw it. Most of y'all know my family. You know, I, I come from a, a, a family of landscapers. We, we, we cut grass. My grandfather cut grass. My daddy cut grass. I cut grass. We've just grown up cutting grass. That's just what we do, you know. And so, so since I've been probably six or seven years old, I've been working. I've been cutting grass, pushing lawnmowers, raking leaves, picking up pine cones, doing all that stuff all my life. Because, you know, during the summertime, that's kind of what me and my brother did to make money. We cut grass, you know, <clears throat> with the biz, family business. So long story short, I've been working church for a long time, a long time I've been working. Um, so when I got fired, you know, although it was an awful thing, the Lord was allowing me to rest. He was allowing me to rest. And I mean, like I said, even when I've been on jobs, 
I've always done multiple jobs. You know what I'm saying? I didn't just teach. I taught and I coached, or I wasn't just an administrator. I was an administrator and this right here. Even now, you know, I'm teaching and I'm coaching. And even on top of that, I'm still cutting grass on the side because I just work. So that's all I know, you know. Um, so when I lost this job now, you know, I'm home, I'm resting, but I mean, I'm applying for jobs. I mean, I'm filling out applications. I'm on every job search website known to man trying to find a job. I was even uh, in the process of getting my Twit card because I heard they make good money out there along Shoreman. So I was about to go drive some cars off the boat because I got to get in where I fit in and make some doggone money and, and provide for my family. So, you know, that's all I know is working. While I'm sitting here and I'm applying for jobs, the Lord was allowing me to rest. You know, he was allowing me to rest. But while I'm home, you know, I said, man, I'm here. I might as well do some things. So I started cooking and I started cleaning. And I started washing clothes. And I started folding clothes. I was doing all that. I was doing all that. And, um, you know, I was getting some stuff done. And, I mean, it, it felt good, you know. And my wife, she was loving it. She was, I'm talking about loving it, man. You know, come home, dinner cooked, the house clean, clothes folded. I'm taking the kids to school. I'm picking them up from school. I'm doing all this other stuff right here. And, I mean, she was loving it for the most part. But I think she got a little jealous because, you know, if I take the kids to school and I do some chores or whatever, when I get back into bed, man, <laughs> and she call, you know, and I, you know, can't hardly talk or don't answer the phone. Would you? I'm in the bed, baby. I'm sleeping. And she started getting a little mad about that right there, getting a little upset. But that's okay. But again, you know, this went on for about three months. About three months, I was home, out of work, you know, no job and everything. And like I said, you know, the Lord just allowed it to where I had enough money during that whole time to pay all the bills, to keep everything on time. They keep everything going and whatnot. But now I'm getting to the point where money is running low. Money is running out. And I'm looking at, okay, January, February, March, taking care of, but house note due in April. The car insurance due in April. What I'm going to do about the month of April? And I, and I start to get a little worried, you know, start to kind of think about, you know, and I, I said, man, let me get back on this phone and call some of these people I applied with and say, hey, man, did, did you take a look at my resume? Did you? Do you know what I've done? You know my history? You know how qualified I am for that job? Did you look at that? I start talking to people I know and, and hey, man, you, you think you can do something? You think you can pull some strings and get me in there? Because now I'm starting to get a little worried. You know, the enemy's job is to steal, kill, and destroy. You know, he's brought me thus far. He, you know, he, 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 he's not going to leave me or forsake me. He's never going to do that. So anyway, long story short, I didn't get any of those jobs. But I said oftentimes early in the message when it's truly the hand of God, you won't see it, and it may come from an unlikely source. It may come from an unlikely source. So long story short, I get a call from one of my fraternity brothers, and he says, hey, Mr. So-and-so wants your number. And I just want to make sure it's fine to give it to you. I said, yeah, give him my number. That's fine. That's, that ain't no problem. You can give him my number. And it's a business owner, and he's just, guy just calls me out of the blue. Just calls me out of the blue. And... Um, he says, I don't know what you got going on. You know, I don't know. I said, things are going well, man. God is good. And I said, I'm just taking one day at a time. And, you know, that was pretty much it. He said, well, I'm going to create a position at this job, and I want to talk with you about it. I said, okay. I, I, he said, when can you come in? I said, man, I ain't got no job. You tell me when to come in. I'll be there, you know. So he told me, okay, come in this time at so-and-so o'clock. So I come in, time. I sit down with him, and we talk and everything. And uh, mind you now. I'm a little upset with this person that's calling me because they said something that I didn't like. They said something that I, who am I, didn't agree with. They said something that bothered with my flesh just a little bit. So I didn't like them. You know, when I was in my hard place and they got interviewed, you know, and, and whatever, and they said something, and I'm just like, wow, man, this is a friend of mine, man. And he said this right here, man. I can't believe this right here. This dude would say this right here. But anyway, I went over, met with him, man offered me, uh, offered me the job and everything. And, um, you know, and I was like, okay, but then, you know, I was talking with my wife and I'm, I'm talking with, you know, certain people. And, you know, I said, man, when I see him, you know, when I, when I see this man, you know, when I saw what he said, I said, when I see him, I'm going off. I see him, I'm going off y'all. You, you, you can best believe I'm going to give him peace of my mind. And I told my wife about it and she was like, yeah, when you see him, you need to do that. You need to go off on him. And I was like, yeah, I'm going off on him when I see him. She right there supporting her man, supporting her man. And, um, you know, right there with me, y'all. 
<laughs> Me and you, baby. <laughs> so anyway, I go over and I meet with the man. And like I said, he says, I, he said, I don't know if you need a job. I don't know what you got going on. I, I, I don't know, you know what I'm saying? He said, but I got this position. I'm going to create it. He said, if you're interested, you know what I'm saying? I was like, I'm interested, you know? He was like, well, hold tight. Now, before you do that, he said, now, I can't pay you what your last job was paying you. Now, I said, it's fine, you know, well, you know, you know whatever. It's, it's all good. And um, now, I had a figure in my head. After doing all my bills, my house note, my car insurance, this bill, that bill, everything, I had a figure in my head of what I needed to make per year, what I thought I needed to make per year, to keep everything afloat. This man told me what he was going to pay me, and it was $5,000 more than what I thought I needed or what I had to have to, to keep myself afloat. Okay? Just touch your neighbor and say it was more than enough. I'm serious, sir. After evaluating everything, all my bills and everything, I came up with that figure, and the Lord allowed it to be that plus some. Plus some. On top of that, on most jobs, you know, y'all y'all been working all your life, most of y'all, you know, if you're at that age. And most times you have to put a, 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 a week in the hole, right? You know, your first week of work, you don't get paid. You get paid the next week, and you got to put that one in the hole. Well, I started work on Tuesday, church. On Tuesday, on a Tuesday, on Friday, this man put a paycheck in my hand. And I was like, okay, all right. So as I, you know, I leave and thank y'all, have a good weekend. I get in the truck, I'm riding home, and I open it up, and I call Sneaker. I say, Sneaker, this man gave me a check today. And when I told her how much that check was, she just started shouting. She started screaming, she started crying, she started shouting, you know, and, and because, you know, just God was so good. Now, of course, I'm happy. My wife's happy. I'm working. So you know the enemy, what he's coming to do. Told y'all he's got three main jobs. Steal, kill, and destroy. Now, he came in the form of friends. He came in the form of colleagues, co-workers, I mean, uh, ex-co-workers, acquaintances. And they came and they said, man, you crazy. How you work for someone that said that about you? Man, if, if I was you, I would have done this right here. If I was you, I would have done that right there. Man, I... Okay, I know you need the job. I would have took the job, but I'd have got him straight first, though. I'd have had to tell him, tell him about himself. And this is what the enemy was trying to do. But see, church, I told you at the start, I ain't on milk no more. Uh -huh, I'm, I'm eating meat now. Come on, come on. I'm eating meat now. So, you know, I ain't let that mess get in my spirit. The word says in Proverbs 16 and, and verse 7, when a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with you. And this wasn't even an enemy. But the world was trying to make him out to be an enemy. So if I was on milk, I would have let the world mess up what the Lord had in store for me through friends, through co-workers, through, you know. Y'all, you, you, you can't trust your crazy behind friends. And sometimes you can't trust your crazy self. You, you can't trust your, I mean, the, the, the word says our hearts are desperately wicked. Desperately wicked. You can't trust your own heart. You got to trust in what? The word says. So although God was restoring, and I know this because how everything unfolded, I unfolded, I still had to accept it. And he's doing it in his way. How many times has God brought something to us that we've been praying for, that we've been asking for, that we need, and we didn't accept it because it didn't come in the form of how we thought it should have came. And our little peanut brain minds, it didn't come how I want it to come, so I don't want that. I don't accept that right there. He may not be ready to give you everything you want right now. He may need to give you just a little piece. And you be faithful with that little piece, then he'll give you a little bit more. And you be faithful with this, and I'm going to give you more. And you faithful in that, and I'm going to build you up more. But he can't just, we go crazy if he just gave us everything all at one time. Church, we've got to just trust in the Lord with all our hearts, lean on our own understanding, and all our ways acknowledge him, and he will, he shall direct our paths. The third and final aspect of God's restoration is being able to wait on God's timing. You got to wait on his timing. Church, you got to learn to wait, man. You got to learn to wait. And that's a hard thing to do in our society right now. We don't want to wait for nothing. I ain't waiting on nothing. I ain't waiting on nobody. Not waiting, you know. 
I mean, you, you think about you think about drive through restaurants now. I, I mean, drive at fast food restaurants nowadays. They got two lines, y'all. Two lines. Two lines. They got people standing out there in the hot. People standing out there in the cold. People standing out there in the rain with their little computer taking orders to try to make it faster. But I'm like, you know, it's still only one window giving out the food. So are we really? Is it really faster? But it makes us think because they got two windows. All you done now is, is call folks be about to get in an accident because they fight for who's going to get to the window first. And they pulling and cutting each other off and trying. All you've done, but that's our society. We don't want to wait on nothing. We ain't going to wait on nothing. We want it, and we want it now. You know, you heard the verse uh, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verse 31. The word says, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Key part of that verse, wait upon the Lord. You got to wait, church. But oftentimes, we don't want to wait, and we start trying to make things happen ourselves. We start trying to manufacture the blessings. We start trying to do it in our own strength, you know. And the word tells in Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the thoughts I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. See, church, we've got an expected end, and it's good. But we've got to learn to wait sometimes. This ain't going to happen when we want it to happen or how we want it to happen. So after I lost my job, I mean, got fired. After I got fired, it was a long process to where I am today. Long process to where I am right now. I mean, God, he ain't through with me yet. Still got work to do. Now, I would have loved for this thing, for me and my flesh, I would have loved for this thing to be over with overnight. I mean, just overnight. Get fired this day right here, week or so out of a job. Walk back into another job in the same position or a better position, making the same amount of money with the same prestige, power, class, whatever you want to call it, all that kind of stuff. I would have loved to do that right there, but that's not what, and, and God can do that if he so chooses. He can do that. He can take you out of this one and put you, you get fired of this one, he puts you up in a better one uh, tomorrow or next week, or he cannot do that. He can make you sit down. He can make you wait and, and do it in his time like he always does. So while I'm waiting on God to do his work, I must admit, and I wasn't waiting patiently. I wasn't doing it, you know. But in spite of my selfish wants and foolish wants, God said, you're going to wait. He had to humble me in some areas. He had to take me through some things. Like I said, I've been working all my life, and I heard about getting unemployment. So I don't have no job, so I'm, I'm, I heard about getting this unemployment, you know. And... So I called Reggie, Brother Reggie back there. See, Reggie's been fired too. <laughs> but just like me, the Lord restored him. He restored him. He restored him. Same way he did me. So I said, Reggie, man. I said, man, this unemployment, man. How, how does this thing work? Reggie's like, oh, man, this is what you got to do. You got to go here. <laughs> You got to fill out this right here. You got to do that right there. Don't check that right there. Now, you check that right there. You ain't going to get your check on time. But you do this right here. I said, man, appreciate that, Brother Reggie. Man, I, unemployment check was rolling. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, but he had to humble me because I'm up in here and I'm all embarrassed. And, you know, man, I'm because yeah, I, I think I'm somebody. You know, I've been a school administrator, man. I'm Terrence Haywood, man. And I really think I'm somebody. You know what I'm saying? And Lord had to humble me. You know, and, and if you've ever been in an unemployment place, you know, they don't give you a number. When they call you, they call your name. And that man was like, Terrence Haywood. And I was like. <laughs> and I walked on up and filled out my paperwork, man, but that check was rolling every week. And, and you know, it was filling some holes, you know what I'm saying? So, um. But now I'm getting this, I'm getting this unemployment check every week. Then I go from that, I go from getting an unemployment check to, to working on this job that I just told you about, you know what I'm saying? And the Lord was just slowly just taking me through this process. Like I said, humbling me in some things and, and, and you know, now this job that I had, you know, if, if I wasn't, you know, spiritually eating some meat, I would have thought, you know, man, I, I ain't, man, please. I need my own office space, man. I, I can't do this right here, man. I'm, I'm above that right there. I'm not going to do that right there. 
no, whatever this, these people ask me to do, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do it as unto the Lord because the Lord is trying to, to take me through. So he got to get me somewhere. So I got to go through this on top of humbling myself. You know, um, I trust in what the word says in Jeremiah 29, 11. He's going to bring me to an expected end. So as I'm working this job, a friend of mine, that's a school administrator. He's a school administrator. And he calls me up just out of the blue and says, hey, man, are you certified to teach so-and-so? I said, no, I'm not certified to teach that. He, I said, all I'm certified to do is to teach, you know, this. He said, well, man, why don't you go take that test, man? And he said, because I got a job that's coming open. And he said, man, if you go take that test and you can pass it, I'll, I'll give you a job, man. I'll, I'll, I'll look out for you and give you a job. Now. I was like, okay, cool. I'm, I'm going to go pass the test. Told y'all, the enemy has got three jobs. Let me see if y'all paying attention. What's the enemy's three jobs? Y'all paying attention. All right. So I allowed doubt to start creeping in. You know, and I'm like, well, man, what if I don't pass the test? And, man, I don't know nothing about that area right there. And I've never done nothing like that. Man, what if I don't pass that test right there, man? And I start letting the enemy just creep in and build doubt and all that kind of stuff right there. And my friend, he said... Well, just go take it again and take it again and take it again until you pass it. And I just won't fill the position. I'll just keep whatever in the position right now. And when you pass it, I'll give you the job. And I was like, wow, look at God. You know, favor ain't fair, y'all. Favor ain't fair, man. It ain't fair. So I go in. I pass this test on the first time. He gives me the job. And now I'm back in the school system. You know, but the. But now the enemy, of course, he ain't done yet. He ain't done yet. He still got jobs to do. So now I'm going to work. I'm smiling every day. I'm, I'm smiling from ear to ear. I'm excited. I'm happy. You know, I'm back in there. And I talked with one of my friends that doesn't live here. You know, so when I got the job, man, I was all excited. And I put in on LinkedIn, you know what I'm saying, back teaching at so-and-so school, you know, and sent it. So when he saw me, he said, hey, man, I saw on, on, on the Internet, man, that you, you, uh, you got you another job, man. I said, yeah, man. He said, well, what you doing? You, you an administrator? I said, no, man. I said, I'm teaching. He's like, teaching? And I mean, he looked at me like I had four heads, man, you know. And um, I said, yeah, man, I'm teaching. He said, you, you back in the classroom? He said, wasn't you an administrator? And, and you let them put you back in the classroom? And I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm back teaching, teaching school again, you know. And again, I go back. If I wasn't on, if I'm on milk. I would have let that right there take away, move out the way what God had me. You know what? You're right. I shouldn't be taking a job like that, man. I'm, you know who I am. But I didn't let that mess get in my spirit. Didn't let that mess get in my spirit because, again, God has got to do this in his way. He sees the end. He knows what's around the corner and what's around the block and what's 10 years from now. But we don't know. You just got to stay your butt in place and sit down and wait. And do what God asks you to do. He's going to elevate you. And, and whatever he needs to do, he's going to do it in his time and in his way. So from there, the Lord continued to move and elevate me and restore me for where he planned for me to be. See, church, when it's all said and done and the dust settles and the smoke clears and, and, and all of that, we've got to be willing to accept his restoration process. Know that it's his restoration and not something we done created and wait on his timing. Wait on his timing. You know, there was a story of this couple. They had just gotten married. Newlywed couple just got married and they were going on their honeymoon. Um, and so they were flying out to their destination and they were going out of the country. And they were late to the airport. The wife fault. I, I can say this from up here. It was the wife fault. They were late to the airport. So a mix-up, you know what I'm saying, at the airport and everything. So long story short, they didn't get to sit together on their flight. Because of the, they were late, the mix-up, whatever, they didn't get to sit together on their flight. So the lady sitting there, you know, in her seat, and, and the stewardess knew that, you know, she had just gotten married, but there were just women sitting next to her. She was like, you know, I, I know, uh, congratulations, Wait, where's your husband? So she pointed a few rows up and said, he's up there. And she looked and was like, oh, okay. And then the stewardess walks, walks away. She walks away, and then she comes back about five minutes later and tells the, the newlywed wife and the husband, you know, y'all get your things and follow me. And they didn't ask any questions. They just grabbed their bags out of the, you know, compartments, and they got their stuff, and they walked on out. 
you know, and followed the lady on up. She took him up to first class. Took him up to first class seat. And they made an announcement on behalf of so-and-so airlines, we have upgraded you to first class. I mean, they got champagne, a, a, a sparkling cider, you know, for some of y'all. They got champagne and all that stuff, chilled on ice right there. These big comfortable leather seats and, and I mean, just your own TV right here, spacious, endless supply of food and drink, everything they wanted. Now, did they get to their destination where they were going any sooner? No. Did they get there any faster? No. No. But their seats had been upgraded. Their seats got upgraded. What was God up to when he sent Jesus to this earth? Upgrading our lives. He's upgrading our lives. Through Jesus Christ, he was offering us a better life, a fuller life. And he came that we may have life and have it more abundantly. More abundantly. So as I end the day, where this refinishing a piece of furniture or an old classic car, it's exciting to see the changes in the transformation that can take place in certain things. In the same manner, every one of, it, every one of us in here have suffered loss at some point in time, and hopefully we felt the joy of having something be restored. This is what God is all about. He wants us to have our joy, our health, our peace, our emotions, our lives, our strength, our souls, everything renewed to perfect harmony with him. Whatever you've lost in this life, God wants to restore it, but you've got to be in relationship with him. In order for that to happen, the only way you can have that relationship with God is through Christ, his son. You've got to have a relationship with Christ in order for God to come in and restore what it is you've lost. So church, I pray you were blessed today. I pray, Lord, that, that you would just continue to bless this congregation, Lord. I just thank you, Lord, for this opportunity this morning. And um, I just want to close with a word of prayer. Amen. Our Father and our God, we just thank you for this day, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, for your restoration power, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the miracles that you performed in, in our lives, Lord, and, and just everything that you've done, Lord, that, let, that you will continue to do, Lord. I ask that you just forgive us, Lord, at times when we ran ahead, Lord, and we tried to do things in our own will and in our own way and our own might, Lord, and we brought you in later. But even still, Lord, you still came and rescued us as you do every time because your words is you will never leave us, Lord, nor forsake us, Lord. So we thank you, Lord, right now, Lord. I, Pray that you will hide this word in our hearts, Lord, right now so that we may, we may not sin against you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I honor you. I praise you and I thank you. This is all blessed. We ask you in your precious son. In Jesus' name we pray.